that I'm about to share with you guys is actually very, a lot, some similarities to what Lauren just shared. And a lot of you might think, okay, well, that's because y'all probably talked about the messages, which is actually not the truth. All Lauren texted me was that she was going to be speaking on, like, um, living to bring God glory. That's, like, all that I really kind of knew. We didn't have a lot of time to talk about it. And so um, when Pastor Marty first asked us to um, give a, a word, me and Lauren, we've done it before at camp. We've done it on love. And so it's kind of fun doing it with her. Um, when, when it's an easy topic like love, because that's just such a fun topic to talk about, because everybody can relate to love. And, um, you know, when Pastor Marty asked us, I started thinking, God, well, well, what do you want me to say? Because he didn't give us a topic. He just said, you know, talk about what's on your heart. And so I just began to really just kind of silence my spirit and ask God, what are you saying? And it was, it, I'm going to kind of share it real quick that I really believe that we as ethnos and actually as individuals are, are stepping into a new season. Um, I know I shared with a couple people that I've talked to is I really feel there's something going on. There's a shifting taking place. And so what I began to do is I love Pastor Marty and Gabe. I think they bring profound messages. And every time Gabe's preaching, I'm like, oh, he's talking to me, you know. Um, but I was really excited just to hear everybody else, to see what, they, what, what God was speaking to them. And I thought it was really cool that Josh started off, you know, um, the very first, that first Sunday. And he was talking about that we are fighting for um, this, new, this gener generation, that we must fight for them and stand for them. And we're the voice that they don't have. And so it really began to challenge us, and I loved it because Josh naturally is like a, a funny preacher. He kind of comes up with like one little you know, note, and he just goes for it. It makes everybody laugh. And so when I saw Josh get really passionate and begin to cry, it did something inside of me. I was like, man, this is coming from his heart. You know, and then the very next message, Marco comes up and does what only Marco can do, and he gets this compilation of an entire like, year of messages, and he begins to put them together and relate them together, and God shows him what God, what he's been speaking over our house for the past year. And it was pretty cool, that statement that, he, that, that God gave him to, you know, um, create or something. Um, you know, and then after that, Colleen comes up. And, of course, I was talking to John. I was like, Colleen is just like a powerful speaker. Like, she comes in with an authority. And so when she prays, you're like, oh, my gosh, that's amazing. And when she speaks, it's like, wow, that's amazing. But it's just because she knows who she is in Christ. And I think it's really amazing that she came up here and she shared that, as a body of Christ, we are out of alignment with the, with the bridegroom. And so we need to begin to, for, first of all, ask for repentance as a whole and begin to realign our hearts with that of God's. And so then after that, you know, Kelvin comes up. And Kelvin, I, I didn't get to hear the entire thing because I was kind of back and forth with the kids, but I would sit there and listen. And he's talking about, you know, the fear of God and that the fear of God is coming back to the house. And I think it's, it's a beautiful thing. It, it, it brings fear, but it's a good God-fearing fear that we're supposed to have. And so I'm just like, okay, God, what do you have for us? And then here comes Lauren with this, you know, um, live to bring God glory. And so I begin to ask God, you know, what, what do you want me to share with everybody? What, what do you want me to say? Like, I've, I've, I'm not this profound speaker that can go through the scriptures and find all this cool stuff. I'm just like, what do you want me to say? And honestly, right there, before I, actually, before I get into it, I want to do stop and pray after that. Um, just sorry about that. Father God, I just want to pray right now and just say thank you for giving me an opportunity just to stand before your throne, Lord. And I just ask that the words that come out of me are the words, the same words that you put in my spirit weeks ago, Lord. And it's something that you created in me from, from the very beginning, from when I was still in my mother's womb, you began to do this in me. And so I just ask that you would allow me and you would use me to transfer what you've been speaking right now, God, and to, to continue to allow us to step into all that you have for us, Lord. So I bless you and I give you all glory, Lord, in Jesus' name. All right, with that, with that being said, with all those words that I was hearing, I really believe that right now we are in a launching season. I believe that God is beginning to put us on the launching path, and he's about to launch us into our destiny. He's launching us into a season of advancement. And with that being said, what happens in a launching session is, is before that there's this preparation. There's this preparation that's taking place. And I really honestly clearly heard the Lord saying that what we've done for the past three years, whether you were here with Ethnos or not, whether you were some of the church, what we've done for the past three years, what you've done for the past five years is not going to withstand what, we, what we're about to step into. And so God is beginning individually. I'm looking at people's lives and what he's doing in our lives. And it's amazing because he's doing something in everybody, not just here at our church, but he's just doing something. There's a shifting taking place in the body of Christ. And it's really excited to kind of see what he's doing. Well, again, I started asking God, so how am I supposed to relate this? What am I supposed to say? I was like, God, can you give me one of those messages like a, thus saith the Lord, and everyone's going to be like, wow, Shia, that was awesome. And I honestly, what I heard was, in the most beautiful tone, don't doubt your gifts. I was like, oh, okay, you know, okay, God, what does that mean? So I began to, you know, talk to God, and, and, and of course, there's still some doubt there. And then I heard him say, don't doubt your existence. It's like, whoa. So you want to step father. Forget about your gifts, but don't doubt your existence. And then after that, the next thing I hear is, don't doubt that I, the creator of all, created you. 
So then I'm just, of course, for a moment, just broken, like, man, God, first of all, you know, don't doubt my gifts, don't doubt myself, but, but, but to forget about all that, forget about me, you're telling me don't doubt you, the creator of all. And so with that being said, um, I get to share a little bit of my life, and I'm going to kind of talk to you all, obviously, it's, I get really nervous, so I get dry mouth. <laughs> um, I get to share a little bit of my life, and so that particular area, I started to med meditate and ask God, what are, you, what are you doing in me, what do you have for me to say? And I also begin to look at, look at who I am and look at what do I actually have to offer God. This, this is an area that I've actually struggled with. I'm going to be vulnerable with you. Some of you know, but this is just an area that I've struggled with over long. It's confidence and, and inter, uh, um, insecurities and, and doubt. And there's a lot of people in here that I believe have some amazing confidence inside of them. And, I, and I'm, I'm sometimes like, man, God, why can't I have that type of confidence? You know, they know who they are. They know what they're called to do. They step into it, no doubt, no fear, and they just go at it. But I know that there's also some people who have a little bit of insecurities in certain areas. And maybe you have a confidence in one area, like you've, you've not, not necessarily perfected, because I don't think there's a perfection in Christ, I mean, here on earth, but maybe you, you know what you're doing in this one area, but there's other areas where you're insecure and you maybe have, don't have as much confidence. And he began to show me that in certain area my, uh, areas of my life, anybody that knows me knows that if I'm excited about something, I'm going to sell it to you. I'm going to be excited. I'm going to go at about 100%, and you are going to be excited with me, and we're going to just be like, yeah, what are we excited for? I don't know. She's just excited. I really believe that if I tried to sell somebody a chewed up piece of bubble gum because it's going to cure cancer, I could sell you a chewed up piece of bubble gum because when I get excited and believe in something, there's no doubt in who I know that God's created me to be. But now give me an area that I don't know and I get so intimidated and I actually do the complete opposite. I retreat. I'm like going into my little turtle shell like I don't want nobody to see me and I'm constantly uh, crying and scared and weak. But it's like, God, how can you make me so strong in one area and so weak in another? What is, what is the problem? What, what am I doing wrong? And I began to realize that this has actually been the story of, like, my life. You know, my past story is full of, of pains and heartache and wounds, confusion, brokenness, bad choices. See, when I was a young girl, my mom left us at such a young age that initially I began to deal with abandonment issues at the age of, like, six or seven years old, not feeling love, not, not knowing what it meant. Now, my, grandma left us in, my mom left us into my grandma's house, which was such an amazing covering because that woman was like our matriarch of the family, and she kind of put this covering of God, and she kind of introduced God to us. And I began to like, man, this is good. This is nice. I, I like this God thing. This is fun. Maybe, you know, he does love me. I didn't necessarily have a revelation of who he was, but I just kind of was going through the walk of it. This is fun. This is nice. You know, but as I began to, to grow up in, in, inside, I began to realize that I was wounded and I was hurt, and I began to hurt others, and I just began to continue to just be held down. And then God, God takes me to a place where I'm a little bit older. I'm now living with my dad. And I remember being so broken at the age of 16 that the only thing that I could do was depart from God. Now, let me backtrack a couple of years because what happened was in my life, when I finally moved in with my dad, I, I began to experience God because I started going to Eagle's Nest. And at that time, that's where I met Pastor Marty and That's where this whole relationship started. And I was in their youth group. And, man, I was feeling God in amazing ways that I never experienced. That when I, that's when I was actually getting a revelation of who he who he is. Well, in that, I, I'm pressing in. I'm going after God. A couple years, I'm going to camps, and I tell, man, I was going to be a, a, a ministry something. I don't know. I was going to Bible school. I had my whole life set up. But what happened was I began to allow compromise in my, la in my, in my, in my life. Because of that lack of insecurity, I began to look up for, live for security in other areas. So I started hanging out with the wrong people. Not necessarily horribly wrong, because they were actually some of my own family members, but I started hanging out with the wrong people. And that whole bad company corrupts good character really began to sink in because I allowed stuff inside of my life that I hadn't allowed before. And so in the midst of that, here I am, you know, uh, 15 years old, 16 years old, I go to camp. And it was the most amazing camp. I mean, I think that was the weekend. And I, I remember just laughing in the spirit. I was gone. I had the most amazing camp. I came back off that bus from at Eagle's Nest, and I was ready to go home and change the world. I was going to change the world. <laughs> and I walk home, and my dad who actually at this time had just got saved and was kind of working with Pastor Marty at this time. And I remember looking at my dad, and my dad says something to me. He says, we need to talk. And I'm thinking, oh, God, well, I just came out of this amazing camp. What do you mean we need to talk? What did I do wrong? I'm doing good. I'm serving God. I'm, I'm speaking in tongues. What am I doing wrong? And I walk in the house, and there's all these papers on the table. And I begin to look at those papers and realize, hey, wait, those are my papers from my bedroom. Like, why are they on the table? They were, like, hidden. And 
one way that I would deal with a lot of my pain is I would write. I would write every, all the time, just write, write, write. But I would write these letters to my mom, my biological mom, because I felt like it was just a way to get stuff out. I was mad at my stepmom, I was tripping, and I would just vent. I would vent on paper, fold them up, seal them, never intended to mail them out. They were actually sealed. And I remember walking over, and every single letter that I had written to my mom was unsealed, open, and read. And I felt so much pain inside because I thought, that's my personal stuff. Like, I don't care that you go in my room and take everything else, but those letters were something so dear and sentiment to the inside of me, no one was supposed to know. That was between me and God. And I got in trouble for it. I got in trouble for what I wrote in those letters. And it was nothing like cuss words, it was just the way I felt. And instead of, instead of my dad looking at the letters and, 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 and hugging me and saying, let me tell you how much I love you, he did the opposite. He said, now you better go in there and apologize to your stepmom, because she's done everything that she needs to do for you and you're in the wrong. So of course, at that point, I already had a little bit of stuff inside of me that I had been messing with. So I was like, you know what? Forget y'all. First step I did was let's write a letter to dad and tell dad how I feel. So I do that again. I'm just like, hey dad, can you read this letter? And he tells me, I ain't reading no letter. If you have something to tell me, tell me to my face. Of course, I don't do that very good because I'm insecure and scared. So I'm like, well, dad, I think that you were wrong because I don't want to. Yeah, I don't know what I said. I was broken. But I remember his response. His response was the same thing I felt when my mom left us. And the response was, Shia, I don't really care right now what you're feeling because that woman right there is the best thing that had ever happened my, in, in my life. And I'll never choose her over you. Broken. Because I did not hear, now as an adult, I really understand what was going on and I'm actually like, it's, it's amazing. But at that, at that time in my life, I didn't understand. What I heard was the exact same thing. You ain't worth nothing. I don't want you. Nobody loves you. I don't care what you do, but I don't. I'm, I'm standing up for this woman. So I decided to cut myself out the family, and I decided to take off. I decided I'm gone. I'm out of here. Forget all of y'all. Y'all can have your little perfect family, and I'm gone. So the very next day, the very next day, I remember packing my stuff, acting like I'm going to school, and I come and I leave. I take off into a world that I've never experienced because even though I had this pain and hurt, I had never experienced the world. So I step out into this journey and I say, I don't need anybody. I don't want anybody. I can do it all on my own. And I remember going through that life so hurt and so broken. And then Pastor Marty, of course, who was still in my life, at one point he had to come. And I remember him sitting there in front of my house. And I was so rebellious. I was so, bo I was so trapped in bondage at that moment. I remember clear as day I can see it. I remember looking through him looking through the rearview mirror, looking into my eyes, and he says, Shia, I don't even know who you are. And as much as it hurt, I didn't care. I did not care because I felt like my dad is now saying, Marty needs him more than he needs me. I'm again worthless. So I I I, I began to live this life that I thought that I could handle. And I, I went out there and very quickly got involved in drugs and very quickly became addicted to crystal meth. I literally did crystal meth every single day because I stayed with a dealer who gave it to me and it was like, clean my house and I'll give you crystal meth. I'm like, okay, cool. And so I'm living this lifestyle, but what I began to see is every single moment that I was in deep, dark despair, I would, I would, I would hear God or I would feel God or I would know that he was there with me. When I was a young girl, my grandma taught me the very first scripture that I've ever been, memorized was Psalm 56.3. And it's what time I'm afraid I would trust in thee. And I kid you not, I would sit, if it even makes sense, I would sit strong out on drugs on bus stops and I just saw, what time I'm afraid I will trust in thee, Psalm 56.3. What time I'm afraid I will trust in thee, Psalm 56.3. That's all I knew to go back to because I didn't know what else to do. That's what brought me comfort and I knew he was there. And so I just continued to, to quote that scripture. You know, I'm going to switch from the testament, but one last thing was, I remember a moment, I was telling Marco this morning, I said, I remember this one moment that I was standing on San Pedro it was like three o'clock in the morning, and I was so broken, I was so done, I was strung out, I hadn't eaten for days, I hadn't, I hadn't showered for days. And I remember sitting there, and I, I, I got the, there was a payphone. they still existed back then. I got the payphone, and I dialed my mom collect, because that's kind of how we'd communicate. We'd always been like a phone call type relationship. And I remember dialing, dialing her phone, she, she accepted the collect call, and I tell her, mom, I'm scared right now. I don't know where to go. I don't, I'm too proud to go home to my dad. I don't know where to go. Now granted, my mom lives three and a half hours away. Most parents, forget about parents, if somebody called me and said they need me, I don't care if they live five hours away, I'm jumping in my truck, packing up my kids and we're gonna go get them. That's just who I am. 
But see, my mom didn't. The response, to, uh, the response that I heard was on the phone was, well, I, I don't know what to do right now. Well, uh, um, well, just call me when you get somewhere safe. And I remember, I remember hanging up the phone. And today the Lord revealed, re revealed this to me. He said, remember that moment that you were crying out that you needed somebody? I was right there holding you. Because some stuff after that happened, but nothing physically happened to me because I know God was right there with me. And the reason I'm sharing this stuff with you, a little about my, my testimony, guys, is because I want you all to understand why I struggle with things the way that I struggle them with and what God is trying to do inside of me and also inside of us so we can begin to really step into the fullness of what God and who God has called us to be. When I finally came back to God, you know, it's been year, years later, all, got a bunch of more junk that happened. But when I, when, I, when I surrendered my life to God, we had just gotten married. And I remember giving my life to God and I'm like, I'm back, God, I'm back. I'm never going back to that lifestyle again. I'm back. And I begin to really believe, like, God's changing my life. He's doing something in me. And, you know, we all have different paths. So some of your, path, your, some of your testimonies don't have to be like mine, like I was on drugs and I did this. Some of your testimonies can be like, you know, God kept me in this. I mean, I don't know. Everybody has a different testimony. And so in that, though, the, the stuff that we go through in life, whether it's by choice, whether it's by the hand that, that was dealt us, we, we, we get wounds. We, we, we get broken. And they hold us down. And so even though I stepped into Christ and I received God and I said, I'm free, I'm, 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 your, I'm your child now, I began to realize I was dealing with all this junk inside and I didn't know where it was coming from. You know, the enemy wants to keep us so broken and wounded because he doesn't care that the fact that we, I mean, he initially cares that we, accept, we receive Jesus in our heart. But really what scares the enemy is when we begin to do something with it. Because if we're just sitting on the sidelines and saying, I'm a Christian, I mean, that really doesn't do anything for the enemy. If you're not going out there advancing the kingdom and spreading the gospel, you're not really necessarily a threat to him. He's still going to try to take you out, still try to discourage you, but you're not necessarily a threat to him. So if he's not kind of doing stuff to you, I've realized, like, maybe I'm not doing something for God. So I've kind of got used to that. But God's going to use the past mistakes of our life to try to call I mean, I'm sorry. The enemy uses past mistakes of our life to try to cause us to fall off track. He causes us to begin to doubt. You know, he did not rescue us from the miry clay so that we can go back into the miry clay. He doesn't rescue you from the pit of darkness to go and say, okay, now walk in darkness. He set us into his light. He, he, he saved us. He pulled us out of that. And then now he's created us to be carriers of light. God's placed stuff inside of you and me that honestly, some others may think that, that, that they're less important. And reality is a lot of times I thought some of the stuff that God initially put in my life was less important. I'm like, but God, you know, I'm, I'm coming from this crazy background. I gave my life to you. I'm big. You know, I'm, I've got awesome testimony. So use me. I'm going to go spread the gospel. But I began to desire, though, the big gifts. And I remember when I first got saved, I, was like, I, mean, I think a lot of us do that. We get saved and we're on fire and we're going out there and really we're dumb. We don't know what the heck we're talking about. We're just like, Jesus, you know, and everyone's looking like we're weird. We're not really doing much. But we're just, we're excited. And it's good, though, because it's, it's something new. So it's not a bad thing. But a lot of us want to go after those big gifts. And, I, and I'm guilty of it. But there's a lot of smaller gifts that we must steward and value before God lets us step into the next season. And an example that I'm going to give you guys is pretty funny um, is, is, is in hospitality. Anybody that knows me knows that Shia likes hospitality. Like, I love to help people. I love to do stuff for people. I'm at the store, and Mark would be, he'd get, he gets mad because I'm always at the store. I'm like, ooh, so-and-so would like that. Can I buy it for them? He's like, it's not even the, it's nothing. Like, no. I'm like, ooh, so-and-so would like that. Like, I'm, always, I'm constantly seeing stuff for other people, or even if I can't do it in my head, I promise you guys, I got all of y'all like 10 different gifts. It's all up here, though. <laughs> I just can't give them to you all. I don't got the money yet, but, but that's just who I am. I love giving gifts. And so in that area, when I first got saved, I was like, I'm a gift giver. I like this. This is kind of cool. Maybe because I didn't experience this, I'm, I'm going to give it to people. So I decide, Marco's working. I just got married. I was pregnant with Diego. Barely got pregnant. And I'm like, well, maybe I can help you. I'll get a job. I'll get a job. Oh, the school's hiring. And the school was actually connected to our church. And it's pretty funny because this school my dad was working at, and I thought, man, I just got saved. They, they, sh they should love to have me in there because I was super cocky, not confident, cocky. And so I go in this job, and I, this job interview, and I walk in, and I'm like, yes, you have a position? And the lady's like, yes, we want you to be the bathroom monitor. And I'm like, the what? What, what does that mean? She's like, you're going to basically, when kids come out of class, you're going to walk them to the bathroom and make sure they go back to class. I was like, bathroom monitor? Who do you think I am? I ain't no bathroom monitor. Like, I, of course, I didn't say that, but that's what I'm feeling inside. Again, it's that 
inappropriate cockiness, and I thought it was God's confidence. It was not. It was cockiness. And I remember thinking, bathroom monitor, ugh, I'll never do that. I don't need your job. So I go and I get some other little miscellaneous jobs that didn't make sense, that didn't last, but it wasn't a bathroom monitor. So I'm going in this and I'm thinking, God, I, I, I got something to offer you. I want to give it to you. You got to take it. I'm ready. You know, put me in front of 10,000 people. I'm going to do it. So fast forward a few years, three kids later, Mark was working, barely making any money, and I'm like, oh, wait, I got to get a job. As much as I didn't want to, I got to get a job. So I said, oh, the school has kind of changed, the new leadership is a little bit bigger. Go back to school. Go back to school, I'm like, hey, here's my resume. Didn't really have nothing on there, just a bunch of odds and ends. <laughs> like, here you go. I'm a, creature, I'm a creature, uh, creature from God. I'm his daughter. You going to hire me? And they're like, there's nothing for you here. I'm like, what? So I try a couple more times, nothing gets shot out. He's getting all these job offers and they're like, nope, we don't want you, we don't want you. And so I said, okay, maybe I'm supposed to stay home. So I, I do the whole stay at home mom for like a, a, a few, quite a few years. But then all of a sudden I got to the point where I was like, okay, I got a job. Got to humble myself and shut up because you don't got nothing to offer these people. So get whatever you can take. And I remember getting a job as a, as a uh, maintenance uh, janitor, but at an office building. It was cleaning offices. And I was like, vacuuming, wiping down windows, dusting. I'm like, hey, I'm a stay at home mom. I know how to do that. I'm going to be good at this. I can do this. I didn't go in there with the same cockiness. I went in there with a little bit of humility. Like, can I have a job? <laughs> and the beautiful thing is, in that humility, I got the job. So I was like, okay, good, I got a job. So here I am working 6 to 10. You know, Marco worked in the day, and we'd switch off. He'd take the kids, and I'm running to work and cleaning. And in the midst of that, I remember the day Marco dropped me off, I was like, okay. I remember Marco, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do it with excellence, because that's what our pastor our old pastor said. Spirit of excellence, everything you do. I'm going to do it with excellence, God. And I said, Marco, the only thing I, I don't want to do, man, I'm going to be mad if they make me clean the toilets, because I hate toilets. Like, it disgusts me. It's not even about, like, a, it literally grosses me out. Like, I'm like, ooh, ooh, like, I don't like it. And so I'm like, no toilets. So I'm like walking the job that day. And she's like, okay, let me go show you. So these are the offices, and this is what we're going to be doing. And you back in, da, da, da. And she goes, but let me show you the area you're going to be in charge of. She's like, you see this whole floor, third, fourth, all those floors? You're going to be in charge of all the public restrooms. I'm like, what? Like, not just like one toilet. It was like every single floor of doctor's office is toilets. I was like, oh, man. But I did promise God that I was going to go in there with the spirit of excellence. So I did. It sucked. I hated it. I hated every minute of it, but I did not complain. I went in there and I gave it my all. I gave it my all. I'm like, I'm going to give it to you, God. I'm going to give it to you in humility. And in that, it was really beautiful because God now began to advance me. All of a sudden, they're sending me to different buildings. I'm taking on like these entire buildings, and they're asking me, do you want to be a supervisor to these buildings? Within months. And I'm like, man, so when you humble yourself, God actually puts promotion in front of you? That's pretty awesome, you know? I didn't know that because that's all it took was me humbling myself. Well, so long story short, that job's really not making a lot of money. Marco's at the school. He had just got promoted to assistant principal. And he says, hey, Shia, there's a position open, but it's a maintenance, which is a fancy word for janitor. And I'm like, uh, you know what, Marco? I just need to get my foot in the door. I need Because it's the same school that I've been trying to get into that I turned down from the bathroom monitor. I was like, I just got to get my foot in the door. I'll do it, Marco. Let's go. So I go for the vacation. They hire me on the spot. I start that next summer. In the summer, it's cool, right? I'm um, sawing in tables. We're building chairs and because we're opening a new school. And it's real fun. I'm like, this is fun. This is cool. And then comes the start of school. And I realize that they placed me at the high school campus. <laughs> Here I am, 25 years old, mother of three. And I'm like a custodian, like, standing there. Like, yes, I'm a custodian. <laughs> and I did have a little bit of pride issues. But at the same time, I sucked it up. And I said, go in here and do it with 100% of ability that God's given you. Do it with the spirit of excellence. So I go in there, and I remember, <laughs> I remember cleaning the toilet one time, and this girl comes out. And at that school, some of you, the staff remembers the School of Excellence. <laughs> so at our high school, we had some kind of ghetto people there. And I remember this one girl standing there, because she's like, Miss, you like to clean toilets? I'm like, no. Do you like to clean toilets? Like, no, but I have to do it because I have to do it. I have three kids at home, and I like my kids to eat. You know, and so I, w I was definitely like, kind of like, this is not, but I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. Two months later, we're sitting in a meeting. We're sitting in a staff meeting, and there's a bunch of janitors, custodians, office staff, all the 4-4 staff. And everybody, every single person is in there complaining about, the buses don't work right. I need a new mop head. And the kid, this, this, this. And I'm like, excuse me, sir, superintendent, sir, guy. I have a complaint. I said, because you told us that we have to tell every single kid to tuck their shirt and whether we're, whether we're a teacher or not. And if we don't, we get in trouble. And so I would stand there faithfully during passing with my little cart, well, big cart, and I'm like, hey, tuck your shirt in. Tuck, get to class. What are you doing? And these kids are like, who the heck do you think you are? You ain't telling me what to do. And I'm like, 
well, you just wait and see. You know, I didn't know what to tell him because I didn't know what authority I walked in. I was just a custodian. And so I remember raising my hand and saying, how are we supposed to handle these kids? And he says, you come and find me, and we will go and walk into every single classroom, and we will find that kid, and I will deal with him. And I was like, okay, cool. All right, that's all I need to know. I'm, a, I'm really going to get y'all now because I'm going to be in all the classrooms looking for y'all. Well, on the way out of that door, little did I know that one little conversation, that one comment changed my destiny in that position. At, I'm at that school. Because on the way out, the superintendent looks directly at me. He says, hey, hey, Ms. Perez, you know that my assistant principals are non-degree entry-level positions? And I'm like, yeah, and my husband's in that position. And he says, OK. That was it. So I like, kind of walk out and go, what was that all about? I was like, Marco, I think next year I might be an assistant principal. Like, I don't know, he said it, and so I was like, I was super excited. I'm like, I'm going to continue cleaning those toilets to the best of my ability. Yee-hee. Within days, he calls me up to the office. And I remember sitting there for like two hours, just sitting out there with my custodian unit. It was on a Friday. And I sat down, and I'm sitting there waiting. And I remember he goes, he opens the door, and he says, well, I've been talking to the principal a lot lately, and we've been discussing this. He says, so you are a new assistant principal for the high school campus. You start Monday. I'm like, OK. Like, completely, like, I, this, forget confidence, forget cockiness. I didn't know what the heck I was stepping into. So here, starting, when I humbled myself and become a bathroom janitor at some building, it promoted me to an opportunity to get my foot into another door. And then I was eventually launched into this position that was not even, like, something that I had the training to do. And I went in there, and I loved every minute of it. The first, few, the first year was horrible because the teachers didn't know who the heck I was. And, but, I mean, God really pushed me in that and began to say, if you humble yourself, and you're faithful in those small things that I give you. I have something bigger, I have something better, and I have something more amazing for you to do. But if you would shut up and stop trying to be something that you're not and let me work inside of you, I can now put you where you need to be. And so I was like, oh, I gotta shut up, which is a problem of mine. So in that, I finally begin to accept that particular gift. You know, I'm like, man, I'm telling you, now we got like the heart ministry, I'm like, hearing and, what is it here? Hearing, engaging, and responding together. We're going to be the hospitality ministry. Now, this is a very area that I'm comfortable in, so I don't have any fear in it. I'm like, okay, Marty, what do you want me to do? Okay, I got it. All right, stand at the door, shake hands, smile. All right, breath mints. Okay, gifts. All right, I got this. You know, it's, it's something that I'm, that I'm comfortable in. And God is doing something inside of me, guys, that I know that he wants to do inside of all of us. And I'm not saying that's not happening in your life. Maybe it is. Maybe this is confirmation. But it's in our obedience to him and the heart attitude that sets us up, set, sets us up for advancement. See, because my heart wasn't in the school, I'm going to be a custodian for two more months and I'm going to get promoted. My heart attitude was, man, God, I'm feeding my kids. It's a job, and I'm going to do it. If you have me doing it for five years, I'll do it. I'm not going to leave my husband out. He's working hard. I'm going to do it with him. And my heart was right. And in that, God began to do something in me. And, you know, maybe, maybe there's words that are spoken over some of our lives, you know, that we're supposed to be an evangelist, a pastor, a preacher. Those are all what I would say in some of the big gifts, you know. Maybe that's something that's spoken over your life, and maybe you're not seeing something um, come out of it yet. Or maybe somebody else doesn't recognize it. It's okay. Because, like, Jesus began his ministry. I think about Jesus' ministry. He didn't start till he was really 30 years old. That's when he was officially going at it. But do you know from the moment that he came out of Mary's womb, he was walking and being, being prepared for that launch date. It was not at 30 years old that he says, oh, now i got to be good. Now I'm, now I'm the father's son. No. He started from the very beginning. He had profound knowledge and wisdom from God because he knew who he was. He was fully man. So it's not like he had some special magical power like, I walk on water. He was fully man. And I think it's so beautiful that we are the same way. From the moment that we were created in our parents' womb, whether they jacked us up, whether they did wrong to us, it doesn't matter where you come from or whether they love the mess out of you. You were created with something so unique and so needed for a time such as this. God spoke to me just a couple days ago and he said, we will never be extinct. It's like, dang. I, so I literally started thinking about animals and how they become extinct and you never see them again. But our, our spirits will never be extinct. We will live for eternity forever and ever and ever. And what we do with what we have right now is going to determine where we live and how we spend it. Sorry. Um, a lot of people's um, spiritual gifts and callings are actually developed in the secret place. That's where they begin to develop. 
I'm gonna be very vulnerable and throw it out there because I think if I throw it out there, everyone's gonna call me to it. I don't even care anymore because I'm ready for it. But a gifting of mine, a desire of mine, you know, God was speaking to me and says, don't also deny those inner, inner desires. And I think a lot of times we have desires inside of us that we're kind of scared to say because we really don't know what the heck it means, but it's something that we desire to do. And so one of the desires that I've always had is actually singing and dancing. And I would, I'm not the type that's gonna sit there and walk up and say, hey, Dawn, can I sing with you? Dawn, look, I can sing, la. You know, I, I, that's not me. In fact, I'm like, la, I can't sing, I can't sing, because I'm so scared and intimidated in this area. But God began to do something inside of me, and he's like, there's something that I'm developing inside of you that is going to have to come out. And if you're, uh, I was listening to Missy Edwards, and there's this part where it says, like, even the children know when to dance. I was like, oh, dang. Even the little kids know when to dance, and you're over here scared of what people are going to think. And so I'm saying that to tell you guys that God is launching me as well. I might be gifted in a hospitality area. God's putting me in different areas. Even up here speaking, this is not necessarily a comfort zone of mine. Don't let it fool you. I, I'm more comfortable coming up as that little crazy Cheyenne character. I can do it then, but coming up in me with my vulnerabilities and my weakness and being exposed, it's, it scares me because I've been crushed so, so many times in the past by others, by their, by, their, by their thoughts or by their comments, and it crushed me. But I'm beginning to understand, you know what? Talk about me all you want. Because when y'all see me up here dancing, I don't care what y'all think no more. I, Tamiko did this little drum beat thing, and I've never ever in my life danced to drums. I've danced, but not to drums. And I was just like, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just like, go at it, okay, yes, Lord, you know. But I, I felt like stuff was just falling off me. Like every beat was just, it was stuff, junk, insecurity. And he says to me then, he says, do you know that your, secure, your insecurities have offended others, have offended you, and that's what holds you down? Then I begin to like, dang, slap in the face. Like, I'm a jacked up person. God called me in all of my jacked upness, and he's asking me to step into something that I have no idea what I'm doing with it. I've never been in a dance program. I never danced on my high school team, I dropped out. I don't know how to do it with the understanding of just forget about what everybody else thinks, but when I come before the throne, it's gonna be different because I'm not doing it for nobody in here. I'm understanding that there is, a, there is a calling inside of me that God has to pull out, and I do not want to stand before the throne of God and say, I was scared, God, I didn't want to do that. I was scared, because I'm gonna be held accountable and judged for that, because he's given me everything that I need to step out of it. And just like Lauren said, we need to, we need to be able to, to come as a family and push each other into our callings and giftings. Because I'm tired of seeing people weak and broken in the church. And it's continual because we want to sit there with our, mmm, they did that, mmm. Did you see how she looked? Who cares? Like, let's push people into what God created them to be. Nobody is perfect the day they start. When I first became a mom, I didn't know what the heck I was doing. I had, I'm changing my son's diaper and pee's going this way, stuff's coming out the other way. My couch, every single time I change, I didn't know what I was doing. Before you knew it, I could do it in the dark. I was good, but we don't know what we're doing when we step into something new. With that being said, I'm trying to like kind of bring it down. I know I'm going a little bit, long, a little bit longer. I'm sorry, guys. Um, but I do want to share a few things that he's been telling me is one of these areas that we really begin to step into who we're created to be, stepping into the fullness of God, which if I had to narrow a topic down, it would be that, stepping into the fullness of who he created you to be, is the, the very first thing which I think is so crucial. It's pursuing him. See, if we get that out of alignment, we're never going to be who he created us to be. Our first thing must be to pursue him. And when I say pursue him, get our hearts aligned with the Father. Just like Colleen spoke, get our hearts ready. Get him aligned with his heart. Don't pursue me this, give me, like when we pursue him, we can't come, okay, give me, give me, give me, God, I want, I want, I want, I want. Oh, I didn't get, oh, I must be, God must not love me. Shut up, you're probably doing something wrong. Like, I realized that was me. I'm not doing anything with it. He's like, what are you talking about? I gave you everything. You're not, you're, you're not using it. I also heard the Lord speak a few years back, and he says, I want you just to want me. I'm here when you need me, but can you want me just to want me? And he, made, he put it like a relationship, just straight up like with Tamiko. Like, we're, we're really good friends. But our friendship doesn't, doesn't come because we need something from each other all the time. Me and Tamiko can sit, like, I, I laugh all the time, because we will sit in the car and go on a long excursion and not say a word. We're like... But there's something that's in that contentment. There's something that is in that relationship that there doesn't need to be this fakeness coming up all the time. It's just who we are. We just enjoy being and hanging out together. And that's what God wants. He wants us just to come to him, just to want him, just to love him. He's going to provide all of our needs. He hears us every, team, every single time we call. He knows what we need. So why do we have to continually tell him? Let's sit at a place where we just want him, hang out with him, 
sit on the couch with them, Re read a book with them, I don't know. Um, <laughs> Um, it's, uh, the, the place of pursuit is when we begin to understand who he is and therefore we can begin to walk and believe who he says that we are. Bottom line. It's in this pursuit that we will discover our callings, our giftings, and then we also discover the confidence to complete what he asked us to do. Is it going to be easy? No. Is it going to be scary? Yeah. He wouldn't be asking you to do something and take a risk if it was easy. And this is where we begin to do the next part, which is what I think is amazing, which is kind of what I started to do tonight, was reflect. Reflect on his love and reflect on his goodness. See, a lot of times we think that looking back is a bad thing. It's only bad when it turns from reflect to regr uh, reflection to regret. That's when, we get to, that's when we get, that's when we're going back and saying, oh, God, I did all those bad things. Oh, let me pick up the guilt again. Let me pick up this luggage. I, I know I laid it down, but dang, I still, uh, I've been there too. Where I've gone back so many times when I picked up the junk, and I'm like, I don't want it no more, God. I'll leave it there. I don't want it anymore. I don't care what people think. I'm ready to step out. I don't care. I'm ready to step into the fullness of what you're telling me to do. Be careful to, be, to stay far away from that regret area. Because, again, that's what causes you to go back. Now, during this reflection, a good thing to do is begin to focus on his goodness. Read his word. I know these are practical things, but read his word. Remember all that he kept you from. I, I don't look back on my life and regret. I honestly don't. I, I look back on my life and I'm like, man, God, I remember what your hand was going to be there. I should have been dead. I'm like, I'm not joking. I, people say that, but I really remember opportunity, chances where I should have been, like, I could have been killed. And it's by the grace of God that he sent somebody and there was a protection that happened where I am not dead to this day. I promise you. I can give you a few stories. <laughs> but he kept me. So that's what I begin to, begin to focus on. And we need to stop focusing on everybody else's gifts. And I'm guilty of it. I'm telling you guys, this is a message for me just as much as it is for you. Stop focusing on everybody else's gifts. John is an amazing worship leader. Lauren's an amazing worship leader. Scott's an amazing worship leader. God has something totally different inside of me. I do get up there and sing. I'm not going to sing like Lauren, ever. <laughs> That's just not going to happen. I can only sing the way Shia can sing. And I can only sing to please him. I'm never going to be up here preaching the way Gabe can bring a word. I'm never going to be able to get in the word and be Mark going, the teacher. I, I can't do it. That's not who he created me to be. And i got to begin to walk in that confidence and know what I have to say is just support when God tells me to speak it because he told me to speak it. Our gifts and callings are yours and nobody can take it away except you. So don't worry about it. Don't feel like we have to do this. That's mine. No, that's mine. Oh, well, I want to dance. And then she started dancing. Well, gosh, I wanted to dance first. Well, she's, well Lydia does flags. And so if I do flags, it's going to be silly. Like, get over it. Like, that's, it's not going to be taken from you. We were uniquely, and, uniquely formed and knit together by the creator himself. The, the, the next thing would be to activate. We must start by doing something now. Because preparation is key for this new season. You can either get left in the dust or come with everybody else. I don't know what, you're, what, what God's telling you to do, but activate it. Step out. We're never going to be fully ready. When, when John came up to me and asked and, and basically kind of pushed me into the jumping on stage, y'all might not hear me all the time, but I promise you I'm giving him my all. I'm up, there just with, I'm up there just being obedient. I'm not saying that I'm like great at it. I'm just being obedient because I'm like, okay, God, yes. And so when you step in to understand that you're not going to necessarily be ready, it's in the doing that we actually become more equipped and ready to do it. If, if, if you're to go to nations, and I'm sure a lot of us here like to talk about nations, we're like, man, I'm going to go to the nations. I'm going to go build orphanages, and I'm going I'm to build schools, and I'm going to do this amazing thing to the nation. But we ain't doing jack here in our own backyard. We need to realize that the nations start right now. The nations don't start when we get our boarding pass and we get a trip and we go over the seas. The nation starts right now. It starts, what are you doing today? Have you hugged that kid in your backyard? What are you doing to cultivate the nations inside of you because you know that's a gift and that God created you to be? You have to leave, same thing, praying, preaching. Oh, Gabe preached so good, I could never do that. But do you do what Gabe does? Because I know for a fact, Gabe doesn't sit here and just be like, oh, I'm preaching tonight, okay. Okay, open the word. No, Gabe takes time to cultivate that message. He sits at the feet for a long time. He's loving God for a long time. It's like he has learned to just be a Mary and lay it all down and let God put that message inside of him, and that's what comes out. Because he studies the word of God, it's inside of him. It's not coming just from here. It's coming from here. So if you want to be a gay or a preacher or a pastor, get up and start doing something about it now. My final thing is, you know, Pastor Marty always laughs when he says that, um, my favorite, he said a few times at the altar, but like my favorite message of all is like the yes message. And I promise you that's like a message that touched my heart in amazing ways. Our response to God should be yes. The only message, I mean, the only response that we should tell God is yes. A lot of times we want to say, yes, but God, 
yes, however, if you look at the circumstances right now, God, I could, but I'll say yes, but it's just because not right now, I'm not really ready, because I gotta go over here, and I gotta, in the secret place, and I gotta get it ready, and then, oh, maybe tomorrow. That's not what God's looking for. He's looking for a yes, and it's in our yes that he equips us with every single thing that we need to go and do what he's called us to do. I want to be able to stand before his throne, which Gabe said was such a beautiful thing. He said, there is a real kingdom with a real throne, and a real king is sitting on that throne right now. I want to be able to stand before the throne, and I want to say that, God, I was obedient to every single thing that you asked of me, whether fear whether intimidation, I don't care. I want to be able to say, this is how much I love you because my answer to everything that you tell me to do is yes. Once we say yes, the very next thing that we must, be, must do again is pursue. See, this pursuing thing never ends. Because if you think once I pursue, reflect, respond, say yes, that I'm done, no, you better get right back on your knees and start to pursue them again. Because as soon as you think that you're big and bad in that gifting, he says, ah! guess what? Now I'm asking you to do this. Because God spoke to me. Get comfortable being uncomfortable. You will live a life of an, of, 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 out of your comfort zone. There will never, we should not allow ourselves to get comfortable. Because if we're comfortable, we ain't doing nothing. So let, us, let God continually put us in an uncomfortable zone. Um, remember that God is going to prevail always. He has the victory. He is our daddy. He is our father. I don't even know what God is asking you guys to do today. I mean, I can start coming up, worship team. I don't know what God is asking of each one of you. I don't know if, if, if people are sitting in here, maybe somebody's saying, well, I don't need anything because I'm doing all that I need to do. Hey, great. I, I, I bless you, and I ask you to continue to pursue in God and be excited when he tells you new things. But each one of our yes is going to be totally different. We also have to be very careful who we share our gift and calling with. There are some dream snatchers out there, man. There are some dream snatchers, and there are some dream pushers. Find the dream pushers. Because those dream snatchers will tear you down and spit you out and not even care. Because they really don't understand who God created. And no one can understand what's inside of you except you and God. There is more that he's wanting to do. That he, there's more that he's wanting you to do than what you currently have. I'm telling you, there's a shifting that is taking place in the body. In this house of Ethos, we are coming into a season when Pastor Marty and them get back, I, we're coming to a season of really launching what we're doing here. The word's going to start to get out. People are going to start coming in. We don't have a time to be some sissy-missy Christians that are sitting on the sidelines that are broken, weak individuals. We better stand up, step into who it is that God called us to be so we can truly understand and advance this gospel, to advance the house of prayer, to be able to go in and, and, and firmly, I mean, to, to fully equip the mission field. So I just, I just continue to ask God, what is it that you want from me today? Where's areas that I might have said no before for fear or, 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 or lack or whatever it may be? Let's come to a place where we ask God to forgive us for that and step in today. Let this be a launching pad for your future. Let's not be broken, worn out individuals like all, like tons of the other churches that we see. Let's be a different people with ethnos. Let's be a people that understand the nations, that understand what it is to be a house of prayer, that understand who we are in Christ. Wow. Wow. I'm sitting there blown away. She had spoken to me about what she was going to say, but to hear her say it from here is just amazing. Amazing. My God, I get to call her wife. You know what I mean? Wow. She's, a, she's incredible. I'm, I'm biased. I mean, I'm going to tell you straight up, I am biased, you know, but... Nah, but